fun. Well, hey, Dave Melinda here, Positive Polarity Podcast. Hope things are going awesome for you this week. I'm starting with a question again, and this one needs some clarification. So I had to find the guy that asked this question. And the question is, is your sales team a sales machine? And I was like, boy, I just didn't really, you know, I liked the team part, not really sure about the machine part. So I'm like, I better get this guy on. So I'm honored to be hanging out with Nigel Green. How are you today, sir? Great, Dave. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So you are a strategic sales advisor. And I have to say, full disclosure, my friend, I've never heard those three words together. So I'd love to um, unpack that. So fill out in the world, what is a strategic sales advisor? So there's in the sales consulting world, you know, it's broad. There are consultants that are great at prospecting and closing. That's great. You you need good sellers. You're only as good as the quality of your worst salesperson. You can have the best sellers in the wrong structure because sales is not sales. Some sales require a consultative approach. Some are more transactional where you have to create scarcity around your offering or, rec or point out to the buyer that they're going to be winners and losers by choosing to take advantage of this or not take advantage of this. What I help CEOs and leadership teams understand is how to build a sales structure that supports their overall business goals. Most of my customers, Dave, have reached a point in their growth where they have an existing customer base, years yeah. of transactional history. Mm -hmm. They've got a team that's already in place and they have a sales leader. But what they've been doing, meaning how they segment the market, how they incentivize their sales team, the technology that they're using that got them to this place of success is no longer working in the next phase of growth. Gotcha. So I come in and help them see how they might restructure data, how they might rethink the compensation plan, how they might better segment their customers, how they might better specialize their sales team to unlock a new level of growth. And sometimes it's more about improving margins, raising price, not just about getting more customers, but strategic shifts that seem small and subtle, but can unlock massive earnings to the business. Gotcha. That's awesome. And I think it's interesting, Nigel, because I'm my next book I'm working on is on business blind spots. And I'm guessing what you just said could be a really big blind spot where people are like, oh, my team is fine. My sales are fine. My customer's happy. My margins are good. My incentive plan is competitive. Do you find that a lot as blind spots when you start to work with people that there's things they really thought were better than they actually are? Yeah, one of the biggest blind spots I find is that their compensation plan is misaligned with their business. So I get I get a CEO that says, our sales are going up, but our margins are going down. And I'm like, okay, so it's important for you because you're established to improve your margin and your lifetime value of customer, but yeah. you give your sales team pricing control. So of course, revenue, you know, number of transactions or number of customers are going up. Your deal yeah. size is going down because you're faced with competitive pressure and you're not defending the value and defending price because yeah. your compensation plan is driving discounts and get the sale done, not improve the margin. So yeah, there, there are all kinds of blind spots. The, the other thing, another big blind spot is I walk into teams of 10 to 20 sales reps and they all have the same job. Yeah. And so they're going to go hire five or seven more to do the sure. same job. And yeah. I'm like, well, you know, you could have a team that focuses on just new business. You could have a team that focuses just on strategic accounts. Sure. You could have a team that sells into your existing portfolio of accounts and sells them a new offering altogether. Gotcha. Like, oh, didn't even think about that. Sure, sure. Wow, those are cool. Well, I love what you said about defending value and defending price. And I think it's interesting because if we only look at increasing sales, that is a pretty bad place to be because like you said, Nigel, you can do it at the expense of margin, right? Anybody can sell more, uh, just drop your number and drop your drop your 
your margin and you're going to most likely sell more. So uh, are you involved with helping companies defend their price and defend their value? Is that part of what you do as a strategic sales advisor? It's not, uh, it's a part of what I do. It's not an offering. Like I don't, I don't get brought in to come in and say, all right, we're going to do a workshop on defending value. Gotcha. Uh, but okay. what I help them understand is that I help them see when they have a sales team that can't defend value that comes in and says, well, the market, all of our competitors are doing or 10 or 15% less than us. Okay. Well then what additional value are you offering to justify the price or what outcomes can you show that separate our offering from the lower price offering? So I point out that they have opportunities where their value proposition is being threatened because of competitive pressure. Sure. Gotcha. Okay. That's awesome. And I, I just think defending value and defending price are so important and like you mentioned, again, is that if we just focus on the sale, we're only looking at half the picture. And, Correct. you know, it, it really is a, a bad place to really just worry about increasing sales uh, without increasing margin. Do you feel like if you increase margin, the sales generally increase with it? Or have you seen any patterns there um, from the, if the goal was to increase margin, do sales tend to go up, down? Have you noticed anything from that perspective? Nothing distinguishable. I think that okay. there are businesses where you don't need more customers. You need to think about how to keep the customers you have and get a bigger percentage of their spend in that category. Yeah. So like I, I've got a client that I work with now that has, I mean, they're doing $30 million in annual revenue. They could go get a bunch of customers to get to 60. They could yeah. get zero new customers over the next two years and be a $60 million company yeah. by getting, getting deeper entrenched and becoming a, being viewed by their customers as an extension of their business and more yeah. indispensable and not just a good service provider. Is that an ego thing, Nigel, do you think for some entrepreneurs where they are trying to, I mean, gain, all I hear is gain market share, right? That's just seems like so important, but we're doing it at the expense of our existing customers. And it's just kind of scary to me. I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. My thoughts are what's, what is the outcome that the business wants? If this is a business that uh, if you're the CEO or the founder and you own this business, it's yours. You invested all the capital. You're the majority stakeholder. You don't, you would sell it for the right price, but selling it to satisfy some debt or equity or investors, if that's not uh, a, a non-negotiable tenant for you, then why do you need more market share? Like yeah. you, you need seller's discretionary earnings. That you, That's what you need money. You need yeah. this thing to spit off cash or dividends or distributions. But I think for another piece of the market, they, uh, they're not profitable or they're barely profitable or they're trying to get to break even. And so they're trying to so getting more customers demonstrates the viability of the offering. Sure. And they're, that's what their investors want to see. So I think it comes down to what do you want? Yeah. But isn't it super expensive? I mean, it's like seven or eight times easier to sell more to an existing customer and it seems to be very expensive to acquire customers in today's um, environment so if somebody to your point Nigel if somebody's listening and they're a break even they make a little bit they lose a little bit they're struggling at that spot you know you talk in, in some of your um, material about 2x and 3x your you know your opportunities if you were talking to that person that was kind of breaking even um, their margins and their sales both weren't where they want them to be. What's like the first thing for them to kind of consider um, small course corrections that they can make? What advice would you give them? First advice, and I give this quite often, is to the the management team that's at, sitting at that break and even. I ask them, when's the last time you went and sat down with your customers? Like, Well, that's our sales team's job. And I'm like, your sales team's job, yes, is to go and sell what you already sell them. 
Yeah. But when was the last time you sat down with them to ask them about who their who your customer's customer is or what they were trying to do to improve their competitive advantage with their customers and their competitors to come up with a new offering? And the, and the answer is, I don't really sit down with my customers. Sure. So you've got to be more in love with the customer you want to have than the product that you sell. And being in love with them is understanding their business so that you can create new opportunities to help them grow their business. And when CEOs get out of their office and start going and meeting with customers, it's amazing the ideas they come back with in the seemingly obvious when they, in hindsight, opportunities they have to go sell them something different. So I love that. What do you love more, your customer or your product? I mean, that's like a really... Again, if you're listening, kind of sit with that for a minute because that really is interesting because if if customer is truly your number one passion, it's going to be a whole lot easier than if your product is your number one passion. And I've run into so many people, and I'm sure you have too, Nigel, that they love their product, right? They just, it's like everything to them. And they just make the assumption that if we build it, they will come, right? <laughs> and so we don't need good salespeople, you know, and, and I want to kind of transition into the hiring piece because it kind of starts at the beginning with a good, you know, I asked the question at the beginning, do you have a sales team or a sales machine? I mean, are you involved as a strategic sales advisor, are you involved in the hiring process? Are you helping that leadership team at, at, at the beginning there? Yes, I help them define their hiring process. And in fact, if if you're wondering about whether or not your hiring process works, I've got a course I sell on my website for $79, cost of steak dinner these days. You can go, it's two hours. You'll get uh, not only two hours of content, but you'll be able to walk away with a new, a, a new defendable sales hiring process, job descriptions, uh, onboarding materials, interview questions. I show you how to do certain types of interviews in the interview process. And and for most companies, they treat hiring salespeople the same way that they treat hiring an accountant, an admin person, and that's the mistake they make. I, my my coach told me very early in my career, he said, son, if you sit down at the poker table and you can't find the sucker, it's you. <laughs> and the reason that's important is that's that's how most sales interviews go. You get yeah. someone from HR that interviews a, a salesperson and they always come back and say, oh, I loved them. They were yeah. so nice. They're so polite. They were funny. They had really good answers. And I yeah. look at them and I'm like, you know, it's their job to be liked. <laughs> exactly. You know, they have an answer to every question that you have. It is their job to have the answer. Yeah. Our job when we're interviewing salespeople is to get them to feel uncomfortable. That's what selling is. Selling is yeah. very uncomfortable. Most yeah. interviews for salespeople are not uncomfortable. Wow. That's really good advice. Get uncomfortable. Well, and again, HR is their general goal is to make someone feel comfortable, right? I mean, that's kind of like, <laughs> they want to be that that um, that person that comes alongside you. And again, that's not good or bad. Um, one of your recent podcasts I was listening to, uh, it's called The Revenue Harvest is your podcast. For anyone interested, um, Nigel has a podcast called Revenue Harvest. And in there, you talked about three mistakes when hiring. So before we jump into the break, can you kind of unpack those three? Because I thought they were very uh, helpful. And again, a lot of times people are doing these mistakes. So you had job analysis, lack of process, and, and based on bias. So can you kind of unpack those for us? Yeah, so uh, most companies, I'll speak to the job analysis. They decide they're going to go hire a salesperson. They need someone. They immediately go to interviewing and creating a candidate pipeline without going and doing the job. You have to sit down and figure out. I said this at the beginning of the interview. Not all sales processes are the same. Yeah. So the type of seller you need is going to be different. You yeah. don't know what type of seller you need if you don't sit down and do the job. So the salesperson 
that gets inbound calls, inbound chats is very different than the salesperson that has to go prospect, run a consultative process, deliver a bespoke service agreement. Those are two different animals. And so you can go hire someone that on their resume has been a superstar everywhere they went, but they've never been required to sell the way your customer wants to buy that's the first mistake. You've got right. to go, sit down, understand how you create tr- transactions. And then second part, no hiring process. They do not map the hiring process to your buying process. Let me give you an example. If you are required to prospect, you need to see that a salesperson can prospect in the interview process. Yeah. If your customer wants to see a demo over zoom and your interview process doesn't require the candidate present an offering in zoom, you're missing it. If your customer wants to see you fly in for the final presentation to their management team, and you don't have that as a stage of your hiring process, you're wrong. Uh, And then the last thing is the bias. And look, we all have biases. My bias is to hire ex athletes. Okay, so if you played a college sport, I'm probably going to love you. (laughs) So what I have to do is invite other credible individuals to check my bias. So I have to have someone, not me, in the hiring process to say, hey, yeah, you're going to love this. I can see why you like this person, Nigel. They're probably great, and you probably would love to go have a beer with them. But here's what you're not seeing because you're blinded by the fact that you know, he was the running back at Ohio state and you you got, you got to, you need someone that can help check your biases. Some biases are industry experience or work for a competitor or, you know, there's so many different biases. You have to know what yours is. Wow. That's super cool. So uh, uh, back to the first one. So I say, I, I would like to interview the job, or I would like to say if the job could talk, what would it say it needed? you know, kind of to your point about where there's a job analysis. We do a lot of work with the personality profile disc and we use science in that hiring. So I'm just curious because in, you know, in today's world, an assessment can tell you how strong somebody is at closing or prospecting or any of the things in between. I mean, we look at, I look at it as like, I use a third of my decision or my client's decision based on their interview, a third based on their resume, and then a third based on the science, some kind of profile. Um, in your analysis or in your process, do you use any type of um, um, science or do you use any type of assessment or how do you make sure to your point that um, they're not just selling you something <laughs> in the interview. How, how do you do that yourself? Yeah, I use a tool called the predictive index. Okay. And yeah, great. Yep. Yeah, the, the PI, what, what I like about the PI over the disc, and, and look, there's nothing wrong with disc or strengths finders. I, I like all of them, and I, I think you just should use a tool. Right. But what I really like about um, – the PI is that it allows you to cr- go in and answer questions. This is part of the job analysis. It'll ask you questions about what's required in the role. Sure. And then it creates this ideal candidate for you. Then you're, what you're allowed to do is to run every candidate that you interview, have them take the test and it shows you how they would compare against an ideal. And so if you already have existing sales reps, I say, go find your best ones, have them take it. And then you'll know kind of what you're looking for. The PI also shows you, you know, just how they're naturally wired versus how they're going to perform when they think they're being observed. Right. And so uh, that's also a very helpful benefit for me uh, to the predictive index. Yeah, that's great. And again, if you're listening and you're in that hiring, if that's part of your day to day or you're the owner and you're involved in that, I think it's helpful to um, Nigel's point to use some type of assessment, whatever it is. Again, there's a lot of them out there. But as we know, um, we can 
pretty much say whatever we want in an interview right now. And it's hard to challenge that because even references, they get the call and they say, yeah, all I can tell you is they worked here for four years. You know, they won't tell you anything. Right. So that, that's where I feel like the look under the hood, so to speak, this is an advantage we need as business owners. And, and so I, I love that um, those mistakes, you know, so again, consider using some type of assessment in there. Try not to use your bias, like, like, you know, Nigel said, and then analyze that job. If it could talk, you know, what, what would it look like? So when we come back from the break, I want to kind of learn about your past because there was a transition for you from corporate America to being an entrepreneur. And we always love to talk about that. So we'll be right back. Awesome. Thank you again, Nigel, for hanging out with us today. Nigel Green, Strategic Sales Advisor. Um, and so you actually started in corporate America. And I love talking about this because a lot of people um, that listen here are at that spot where they want to jump in to owning a business. They want to jump into being an entrepreneur. Um, but they don't know what that looks like. And for some of us, it was like a day one We've always been there. Some of us, it was a journey. So kind of fill the listeners in today, if you can, Nigel, on your journey from corporate to becoming an entrepreneur. So uh, I think it was probably 2011. I read Tim Ferriss's book, Four Hour Work Week. <laughs> and it it really helped me think about, at the time I was leading a medical device sales team, and I got a lot of really good wisdom about it or, or from that book about, you know, just optimizing, outsourcing things I didn't want to do, et cetera. And then in 2015, I just had my second exit, sold a company to Universal Health Services. And I thought, well, maybe I want to go run run a business. So I became the CEO of a company called StoryBrand. And that wasn't corporate. It was kind of corporate America, but it was my first like CEO job. Okay. And I realized, man, I, I just don't like work the way most people think about work, uh, which is uh, coming into the office, having people report to you. And and so I went back and I thought, what what am I doing? And I and I pulled back the four hour work week again, and I remember this story, and there was a story in there about a a couple of executives that went down to Mexico to uh, go on a fishing trip, and they went out with this boat captain, and he took them out and they fished all day and they caught all kinds of fish, and they came back and they were and he was cooking the fish over the fire. And he was playing his guitar and they were drinking beers. And they said, you know, you're probably the best guide we've ever had. And we think that if you, if you did a couple more charters, you could probably save a little bit of money and buy another boat. And then you could scale that, get another guide, make a little more money sure. and then have another boat. And then you could build out this whole charter business. And then you wouldn't, you wouldn't have to do what you're doing anymore. And he said, you mean get up, go fish, drink beer and sit by the fire and eat. Like, that's what I'm already doing. And I thought, <laughs> my God, what am I doing with my life? Yeah. You know, why am I trying to go stack all this cash for someday? And so like, before we hit record, you asked me, how was my day? I said, I got up hung out with my kids, went for a surf, and now I'm back here. So I redesigned my life around yeah. not someday, but today. And that just doesn't really work in corporate America. Yeah. Wow. That's so cool. So um, so then how did you land in this sales advisor role? Because there's probably, again, a lot of, I, I get this ad question, yeah. the statement, I don't know what I want to do when I grow up. I mean, right now I'm working with a variety of people that are totally. in transition. They're like, what in the world do I do here? So you realized that you didn't want to do corporate America. You realized that you wanted to surf, but there's kind of this big gap between those two. So how did you kind of figure out what you wanted to do? 
the gap's not as big as it seems. So my friend okay. Rory Vaden told me, he said, and he, he talks about this. He Rory Vaden uh, is the CEO of a company called Brand Builders Group. And he said, We're, we are most capable of serving the person we used to be. That's it. So if, if you want to be useful or if you want to become an expert or an advisor or a coach, who did you used to be? And so for me, it used to be the vice president of sales for a quickly scaling healthcare company. Right. And I did it twice. And so now I just talk to people that are doing that. And it's not very different. I mean, the, the, the world has not changed that much, even in the last decade. You got to build a team. You got to hit a number. You got to deal with investors. You got to yeah. understand technology. You got to be able to go into a boardroom and cast a vision and manage expectations. And so I just talk about my life from 2010 through 2018 or 19 over and over and over again. And the beautiful thing about it is I get better because I learn from them. Yeah. I see the market through their perspective and the challenges that they're facing. And it refines the way I think about problems that I used to have. And that's, that's how I built this business is just serving the people I used to be. Wow. So again, for people listening, find what you're, I mean, they always say find your passion, right? And so it, it's, it's, and then some people say, well, I love chocolate. And it's like, well, okay. I mean, it's kind of hard to figure that out. Was sales always something that you were driven towards and that you were good at? Sales is always something I was good at because okay. I'm curious. I was only driven towards it out of necessity. I needed to make money. I grew up very humble. Uh, football paid for my college. And then when I got to college, I realized, well, shit, I got to make money. What am I going to do? Like, I mean, like I got to get a job. What makes the most money? And I just researched it and it was medical device reps. And they, and I was like, well, great. They tend to love to hire ex athletes. So good for me. So I just threw myself into figuring out what I needed to do to be a medical device rep. And guess what? They make a lot of money. And so yeah. if you can get really good at it, you can make a lot of money. <laughs> so do I dare ask what college? It better not be a Big Ten college. No, it's a small liberal arts college, Division Three football. You've never heard of it. Uh, it's called Suwannee, the University of the South. Okay. All right. Well, we just have a uh, we have a sweet spot for uh, Wisconsin. So I just wanted to make sure you weren't when you said Ohio State. I'm like, oh no, I hope he's not going to say Ohio State. So um, that's awesome. Yeah, hey, I want to turn the corner here for a second because you talk a lot about the cost of what a bad hire is. So I want to talk about kind of two different things, because again, there might be people listening right now that have a team, but they aren't, um, they're not really um, working as well as they could be. So do you kind of think about reshifting? Do you terminate? Do you, I mean, are you quick to fire? W what advice for somebody that doesn't have a good team would you share with them in light of the cost of that bad hire? I, I tell people, you know, the, the data shows that it's about $115,000 on average. to That's what it's going to cost you. Not to replace, but that's what it's going to cost you when you make a bad hire. And so, again, this goes back to this is why the analysis is the job analysis is so important. This is why having a process is so important. And this is why ultimately checking your biases are so important. Hope is not a good strategy. And when you hope a sales rep is going to get better or when you hope a sales rep is going to recover, you need to let them go. And here's why. Most people say, well, that's not unkind. Or that that's not very kind, or I need to be uh, I need to work with them. You need to own that you made a mistake, and you need to be generous in your severance package. But you need to let them go. Yeah. It, it's costing you so much money, hoping that they're going to get better. And so I I think you got to be slow to hire and quick to let them go. Uh, and and to do it any other way is is it's not very kind to them. Yeah. So I'm just curious if, if somebody has something. 
again, we all have the round peg square hole kind of thought where we maybe we have the person on our team now, maybe, um, you know, we've had them in the past. Am I better off not having a salesperson? Am I better off having an open territory or an open role rather than, hey, I'm going to keep him on or her on until I find a replacement? Because I think that's what generally happens is, hey, I got a, a person subpar. We've, we've invested money in them. We've tried to make this work. We just don't see any change. Um, so now I'm going to start trying to find a replacement. Well, that might take six to 12 months, depending on, you know, what's going on there. Um, what do you generally tell people that are in that predicament right there, Nigel? Well, I generally tell people don't get in that predicament. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so I try to tell them that uh, this is a bad problem. There's a yeah. better problem. And you can you cannot have and this is right in this is like what I talk about in my coaching practice with these sales leaders. I tell them there's two things I know about customers and, and really good reps. They always leave and they leave at highly inconvenient times. Yeah. So I'm always challenging the folks that I coach. What if Sally leaves or what if Johnny takes a new job? Oh, they're great. They're they're, they're Listen, they leave. People leave. So uh, the best sales leaders, and this, if you're a CEO and you're the de facto sales leader, you have to be a talent magnet. You have to have a bench of people that are ready to go all the time. And so what I do in my coaching program is we, every quarter, they have to present to me a list of candidates that they don't have a position for, that are currently working, that they've completed the interview process with. That if something were to happen, they can make an offer to tomorrow and sure. they would be ready to go. Because you yeah. you look so much better to your CEO when you say, hey, hey, Dave, Mr. CEO, Johnny's going to leave. He put it in his two weeks notice. But remember Sally that I showed you in the last quarter board report? She's going to start tomorrow. And I, I can yeah. let Dave go today. Yeah. Dave's going to he doesn't have to work his two week notice. He can go on to his next job. We're just going to bring Sally in. and She's ready to yeah. go. And you're like, damn, OK. Yeah ready to go. Yeah. And so, but if you find yourself in that predicament, man, that's no good. Yeah, That's no good. And it's very avoidable. Wow. Well, and like you said, though, how, I mean, let's be real. People are trying to make payment or make rent. They're trying to make payroll. They're trying to, you know, satisfy their customer. This proactive approach of, you know, having a bench you know hey our bench is empty you know i mean having a full bench i'm in complete agreement with you i'm like hey i, I think the backup quarterback makes or breaks you know a, a, a company or a football team you know that backup quarterback if they if, if you can't walk in the next play and pick up like the person you're you know ahead of you uh, there's a there's a major drop and we've all seen that in in pro football um but yeah, and I think that's probably where I got this philosophy is, you know, being yeah. a football guy. I mean, I had yeah. a co I was a running back and my coach used to tell me, hey, you're just one ankle away from being the starting running back. Yeah, it's that simple. It, it could happen yeah. this next play. You're the start running back. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago, we had Monte Ball Jr. on our show, who is uh, Big Ten. Uh, he was an awesome Wisconsin Badger, ended up getting drafted in the second round mm -hmm. and played for the Detroit, uh, Detroit I would say Detroit. Um, Denver Broncos. Well, he said in his uh, sophomore year in at UW Madison, he was an unknown, and two guys in front of him in one game went down. So he went from third string to first string in the matter of two hours, and after that, he never looked back. And he scored yeah. seventy-seven touchdowns. He scored. I mean, he was just like he put up these numbers that were incredible. But to your point, he was he went into that game thinking, ah, oh, here's what probably I don't know. I shouldn't say this. Most people would have gone into that game. Well, here's another, you know, third stringer. I'm probably going to be standing on the sideline. But I tell you what, that's that's a poor choice when you have a sales team to have an empty bench because people do go down, whether someone takes them out, they quit, whatever happens. So. Um, I'm assuming that's and some so advice the, that you're telling people on a consistent basis. It is. And what I'd say to that is like, uh, if I know Monte Ball, he, uh, he wasn't going into that game saying he, he was getting mental reps. He was watching every play yep. as if he were, he was, and he knew his time was coming. And so yep. 
the reason he was doing that is because his coaches kept him mentally engaged. And so yeah. if you lead a sales team, your job is to not only keep your existing team mentally engaged, but everybody that you're recruiting, checking in on them, making sure, hey, how's your job? How are things going with you? I know we still don't have a spot for you, but look, it, it could happen tomorrow. You've got to keep your pipeline and your bench warm. Yeah. Always be recruiting, right? Always be yeah. looking. Always be watching because um, you never know. I, I mean, I don't want you to live in fear, but I think you got to live kind of in a reality because like you said, good sales reps come and go. Um, totally. Well, that's know. like, you know, I, I will, I'll say this about, uh, I love Nick Saban. I'm an Auburn fan, but I still love Nick Saban. Yeah. Nick Saban, uh, not a great X's and O's guys, that, as, as evidenced by his time in the NFL, where the talent is largely equal when he was with yeah. the Dolphins. Not very yeah. good. And yeah. Nick will tell you, I'm not an X's and O's, but I'm a Jimmy's and Joe's. Yeah. He is the best college football coach because he just went out and got the best dudes. Just got right. him. Yeah. And he was easy to connect with. And, um, yeah, I think that – how do you – I want to ask this as we start to land the plane today um, – because there might be people listening that are sales leaders that feel like, oh, my gosh, I don't even want to call Nigel because he's going to steal my job. He's going to make me look bad. I mean, how do you play with sales leaders, sales managers, director of sales? How do you come alongside them so that uh, they don't feel threatened? I'm just curious how that works. You know, because I don't want their job. I had yeah. their job. <laughs> and so that's that's the I will tell you that it is rarely, rarely the instance that I feel threatened. The type of person that works with me yeah. wants to get better and probably has some type of seven figure payday at stake for them through an equity agreement or profit sharing that is available if they get better. Yeah. And so they don't see me as a competitor. They see me as an ally. Most of what I do is all through them and behind the scenes. Gotcha. So they just look like superstars to their CEO and management team. So for someone listening, Nigel, that might be in the three to five million dollar range. They're not in this level there. Are there do you come alongside and help those types of people too? Yeah. Or do you generally you know send them to your courses? How would somebody like that work in, in for you? I have a lot of different types of coaching uh, arrangements that are out there. I've got CEOs that want me to come in and lead a strategy session once a quarter. And, and I do it that way. I've got where they think of it as phone a friend once a month where mm -hmm. they show up for an hour and it's more therapy about dealing with their sales team. <laughs> to uh, arrangements where it's intense, where I'm observing them on their weekly sales meeting. I'm watching them observe that uh, doing sales trainings. I am helping them get ready for a board meet. There's a whole spectrum of ways in which I can be helpful. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I think it's funny. I think in strategic sales advisor should be strategic sales therapist, like you said, right? Because There's a lot of that. There's just, and we don't know what we don't know. And and as we end today, I think it's really powerful to be able to admit that you don't know something. And you look at the best athletes in the world, they have coaches surrounding them to be able to tell them what they don't know. They don't know what calories to count, or they don't know what muscles to, you know, expend energy on. And that's why they surround themselves with those kinds of people. So um, one last question, Nigel, and let you go. What would your tip of the day be for somebody listening? Um, maybe it's something we covered. Maybe it's just something on your heart right now that you feel somebody really needs to to hear. Um, what would that be for for someone listening? What's really served me is um, this concept, and I, I got it from Ryan Holiday's book, Ego is the Enemy. I try to live by this line. As my island of knowledge grows, so does my ocean of ignorance. <laughs> that the more I learn and the more I study, the less I believe things are so. 
And so I, I, I see a lot of times in the interview process, I mean, today I interviewed this guy for a sales leadership role. And I said, what are you reading? And he's like, well, I just don't really, I'm self-taught. I don't really read books. And I'm like, well, we're done. <laughs> we can hang up the phone right now. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So Ego is the Enemy is a good book you mentioned in the four hour work week. So for anyone listening, a couple of great books that, uh, you know, Nigel mentioned. Um, and one last thing. So if people do want to get to connect with you, maybe something that you said today um, inspired them. They want to learn more about your services. They have a question for you. What's the best way for people to get in contact with you? I mean, the best way is you can go to my website, nigelgreen.co and book a call. I don't charge for it. You can get 30 minutes of my time and we can talk and go from there. Uh, my book, if you wanted to read it is the digital copy is $5. You can get that on my website. You won't find a better deal on the book. Um, yeah, that's how you get in touch with me. Awesome. And then the book is revenue harvest, a sales leaders almanac for planning the perfect year. And I was mm -hmm. like, when I saw that, I'm like, all right, perfect year. I, I, I would be happy with the perfect day, Nigel. And now Nigel's telling us there's a perfect year. So Five well, bucks, a jump. There is a perfect year. Yeah, it's the one where you hit your number. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sales numbers and revenue numbers and margin, right? And yeah. performance numbers. I mean, we could talk all day. Thank you again, Nigel, so much for hanging out with us. Um, and again, for people listening, rather than just jump into your next podcast, you know, just jumping into your next activity, I just want to encourage you to kind of you know, ponder something that Nigel talked about today, maybe one thing that really spoke to you. And rather than, again, let it just get buried, do something with it. You know, call Nigel, 30-minute free call, jump on his website, get his $79 course, um, you know, look at something that was uh, talked about today as really making a difference for your sales team so that you can actually turn your team into a machine and uh, um, nothing better than sales teams crushing their numbers. So uh, thanks again, Nigel, for hanging out with us and can't wait to keep learning from you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Dave.